Father Lang is a staff member of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments and coordinator of the Master's Program in Architecture, Sacred Art, and Liturgy at the Università Europea di Roma, Ateneo Pontificio Regina Apostolorum. That's a mouthful. In September 2008, he was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI as consultor to the Office for the Liturgical Celebrations of the Supreme Pontiff. This evening, Father Lang will be addressing us on the subject of art, beauty, and the sacred, three things which I dare say are all too frequently separated and at our peril. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Father Michael Lang. Thank you very much, Dino, for this kind introduction. Fathers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak to you tonight about a subject that is very dear to me as a theologian, uh, art, beauty, and the sacred. My own work, both for the Holy See and as a scholar, has focused really on art at the service of the Catholic liturgy, sacred art. In this field, I am also aware that for many of you, your artistic work is not confined to sacred art, and so in the first part of my talk I would like to share with you some general reflections on art and beauty, which I hope will be helpful for your work, for all of you. And then in the second part I would like to say something about sacred art specifically. The first part of my uh, talk this evening has the title Art and the Crisis of Beauty. Our Holy Father, Pope Benedict, at a recent occasion has called artists custodians of beauty, as in fact his predecessors, Paul VI and Blessed John Paul II, have done before him. This title, Custodians of Beauty, is significant not least because in the Catholic tradition, beauty is not simply an aesthetic criterion, but has a far wider scope. It is understood as a philosophical and ultimately a theological category. It was the Franciscan theologian Saint Bonaventure who first numbered beauty among the so-called transcendentals. This means that beauty is considered a property of being itself along with truth and goodness. This refers in the first place to God who is being itself and hence truth, goodness and beauty itself. The Dominican theologian St. Thomas Aquinas does not list beauty among the transcendental properties of being, but in fact speaks of the universal extent of beauty and names God as its first cause. What this implies is that art is, as the expression of the beautiful, capable of revealing reality to us, and sacred art in particular has the capacity of manifesting to us the beauty of God, divine beauty. There is a remarkable passage in the Catechism of the Catholic Church that sums up this theological concept of beauty. I would like to quote it in the very concise version that is found in the Compendium of the Catechism, published in 2005. In the section on the Eighth Commandment, you shall, bear, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. There is question number 526. What relationship exists between truth, beauty, and sacred art? And the response is, the truth is beautiful, carrying in itself the splendor of spiritual beauty. In addition to the expression of the truth in words, there are other complementary expressions of truth most specifically in the beauty of artistic works. These are the fruit both of talents given by God and of human effort. So far, the Catechism speaks about art in general. Then it goes on to say, sacred art, by being true and beautiful, should evoke and glorify the mystery of God made visible in Christ and lead to the adoration and love of God, the Creator and Savior, who is the surpassing invisible beauty of truth and love. 
In this passage of the Companion of the Catechism, the in intrinsic relationship between truth and beauty is affirmed, and particular attention is given to works of art, which are born from the divine gift of human creativity, and I'm sure you all know too well, hard work. Later I'm going to say more about sacred art, but for the moment I would like to focus on this transcendent dimension of beauty as expressing or revealing truth and goodness. And I would like to do so precisely because this transcendent dimension of beauty is contested in the context of modernity. Beauty has been divested of its ontological significance. It has been, as it were, emancipated from the order of being and has been reduced to an aesthetic experience or indeed to a matter of feeling. There has been a radical turn to the subjective as far as beauty is concerned. This has been really a, an intellectual revolution and the consequences of it are not limited to the art world. The Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar has seen this very clearly. He dedicated several volumes to what he called a theological aesthetics. And in one of these volumes he writes, in a world without beauty, even if people cannot dispense with the word and constantly have it on the tip of their tongues in order to abuse it, in a world which is perhaps not wholly without beauty, but which can no longer see it or reckon with it, in such a world the good also loses its attractiveness, the self-evidence of why it must be carried out. Man stands before the good and asks why it must be done and not rather its alternative, evil. For this too is a possibility and even the more exciting one. Why not investigate Satan's depths? This dense quotation from an outstanding Catholic thinker of the 20th century requires some commentary. In fact, the Catholic tradition has taken up from classical Greek philosophy, especially from Plato, the idea that truth and goodness attract us because they are beautiful. Truth and goodness draw us in because of their beauty. Thus, what is good, in other words, what ought to be done, becomes self-evident in a sense because it attracts us. However, Balthasar notes, when beauty is detached from this intrinsic connection with truth and goodness, when it becomes, as it were, autonomous, then the good loses its force of attraction and becomes simply a matter of choice, one possibility among others. We are not concerned here with the moral consequences of this intellectual revolutions, but, but rather with their effect on art. One result of this isolation of beauty from being or truth has been a phenomenon described by the Italian philosopher Remo Baudet as the apotheosis of the ugly. Incidentally, uh, this Remo Baudet, who describes himself as an agnostic, was one of the participants at last week's Assisi meeting for peace in the world, where the Holy Father invited not only leaders of religions, but also well, agnostics, atheists, and Baudet was one of the participants, so in Italy a very um, eminent and well-known figure. What does he mean by apotheosis of the ugly? He means an aesthetic theory and practice that rejects anything that appears to be beautiful as a deception and holds that only the representation of, representation of what is crude, vulgar and low is capable of expressing the truth. No doubt the ugly was present, is present in the classical tradition as well, but it served as a contrast, a backdrop to the beautiful and you think of images of the Last Judgment where the devil and his angels are painted often in the most grotesque and monstrous way to highlight the contrast with the beautiful reality of heaven. However, what Baudet means by the apotheosis of the ugly goes much further. Beauty itself is suspected. It is suspected as being deceptive. 
And the consequence is that beauty is no longer sought. Such an analysis of the state of the arts in the modern world is shared by some art critics of renown. I would like to refer here to the French author Jean Clair, who made an outstanding contribution to the court of the Gentiles in Paris on the 25th of March of this year. This court of the Gentiles is an initiative promoted by the Pontifical Council for Culture in the name of the Holy Father. The image is drawn from the temple in Jerusalem, which had a court for the Gentiles who were at some distance from the sanctuary, from the Holy of Holies, but still sort of related to it. They couldn't quite cross the threshold, were not quite ready, but um, they were not completely removed from it either. And this idea of the court of the Gentiles is really about bringing about, renewing, starting again, a dialogue between also the, the church and the arts. And at this occasion, John Clare published a very remarkable analysis of well, the state of the arts in the contemporary world, especially uh, with regards to the sacred, and um, does not spare his criticism for um, certain forms of artistic expression that uh, have been admitted really in, into churches recently certain um, works of art um, that have been commissioned for churches but really failed to live up to their vocation to express the sacred. A little closer to here, uh, the American critic Roger Kimball published an essay in the journal First Things in 2008 with the suggestive title, The End of Art where he comments, we behave as if art were something special, something important, something spiritually refreshing. But when we canvass the roast of distinguished artists today, what we generally find is far from spiritual and certainly far from refreshing. Kimball continues with a critique of the cultural avant-garde, which in his view has transformed the practice of art into a purely negative enterprise in which art is either oppositional or it is nothing. And he sees a tendency to replace aesthetic achievement as the goal of art by celebrity. I consider this critique quite pertinent. In fact, we are living through a cultural crisis, at least in the West, that seems to reject the very concept of fine arts that is ultimately grounded in a transcendent vision of beauty, even if it is not explicitly Catholic, not ex explicitly Christian. This idea of the fine arts is ultimately rooted in a concept of beauty that uh, we, from the point of view of the faith, have in common. And at the heart of this rejection of the concept of the fine arts, there is the loss, or rather the denial of beauty itself, beauty as and philosophical category. The school of thought has had an effect on the church's life as well, on the Catholic liturgy, on sacred art, sacred architecture, sacred music. In the last 40 years, it has not been a rare thing to hear that beauty is not an appropriate category of the church's worship. And a considerable part, it needs to be said, of the church's cultural and artistic patrimony has been squandered, often in the name of false, uh, falsely understood honesty and simplicity. Generally speaking, an iconoclastic attitude seems to be a constant temptation for theologians, and it recurs again and again in the history of the church, not least in the 20th century. The phenomenon of iconoclasm is by no means limited to the Byzantine Empire of the 8th century. The problem in our cultural context is, in my view, this. Ever since the turn to the subjective, which is a compelling consequence of the Enlightenment philosophy of Immanuel Kant, 
it has been extremely difficult, if not impossible, for philosophers to restate the metaphysical foundations of beauty, which is upheld in the Catholic tradition. I consider a recent and indeed very fine book by the philosopher Roger Scruton on beauty an excellent example of this aporia. Scruton is, of course, aware of the philosophical tradition of the Enlightenment turned to the subjective, also in the field of aesthetics. In fact, um, the philosophical discipline, aesthetics, was only developed in the 18th century. And Scruton is also aware of the need to recover the metaphysical foundations of beauty, but in the end, it seems to me, cannot do so and must limit himself to question of good taste. Now, certainly the idea of an education of aesthetic taste goes some way, but um, as the saying goes, de gustibus non est disputandum, and if I may paraphrase, paraphrase this, good taste cannot provide foundations that would be stable enough to build, rebuild the metaphysical grounding of the arts today. I'm not a philosopher and I'm not competent to provide you with a philosophical response to this burning question. Instead, I should like to try to give you elements of a theological response, drawing on the Catholic tradition. Kimball, to whom I have already referred today, notes, if beauty can use art to express truth, Art can also use beauty to create charming fabrications. Instead of directing our attention beyond sensible beauty toward its supersensible source, art can fascinate us with beauty's apparently self-sufficient presence. It can counterfeit being in lieu of revealing it. Here he really restates what he sees as a tendency in Western thinking, and um, you can find this ever since Plato, to oscillate between an adulation of art and a deep suspicion of art. One example would be the Russian writer, Orthodox Christian, Fyodor Dostoevsky, who in his novel The Brothers Karamazov of 1880 has his protagonist, Mitya Karamazov, say, Beauty is the battlefield where God and the devil war for the soul of man. This really echoes an important teaching of the tradition of Holy Scripture, which asserts that there is also a false kind of beauty that does not lift us up towards God and his eternal kingdom, but instead drags us down and stirs disordered desires for power, possession and pleasure. The book of Genesis makes clear that it was such false beauty that led to original sin. Eve saw that the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden was a delight to the eyes, Genesis 3.6. It only needed the temptation of the serpent to provoke the first couple's rebellion against God. The same Dostoevsky has a very famous, often quoted passage in his novel The Idiot of 1869. His Christ-like hero, the Prince Mishkin, says, I believe the world will be saved by beauty. On the one hand, beauty is the battlefield where God and the devil war for the soul of man. On the other hand, the world will be saved by beauty. Now, when Dostoevsky and all of those who have taken up this quotation have made it their own say that the world will be saved by beauty. Not any beauty is meant here, but the redemptive beauty of Jesus Christ. The present Holy Father has written a profound essay on this subject, which he gave as a talk to the 2002 annual Communion Liberation Meeting in Rimini. And he begins by meditating on Psalm 45, uh, 44 in, in the Latin numbering, which is a poetic description of the wedding of a king, of his beauty and his virtues, and then a lyric praise of his bride. The church in her exegetical tradition 
has read this psalm as a representation of Christ's spousal relationship with his church, and in fact has recognized Christ as the fairest of men. And when the psalm says grace is poured upon his lips, this points to the beauty of Christ's word, the glory of his proclamation. So it is not merely the external beauty of the Redeemer's appearance that is praised here in the psalm read through the revelation of the New Testament, but is rather the truth and the beauty of truth that appears in him, ultimately the beauty of God himself. Beauty of God that captures us with the wound of love that enables us to go forth together, as the psalm describes, in the form of a procession with and in the church, his bride, to meet the love God who calls us. Now, the church proclaims in poetic form Christ as the fairest of men, but it is the same Christ to which the church, remembering his passion, applies the word from Isaiah, he had neither beauty nor majesty, nothing to attract our eyes, no grace to make us delight in him. And so, then Cardinal Ratzinger concludes, in the suffering of Christ we come to know that the beauty of truth also embraces offense, pain, and even the dark mystery of death, and that this can only be found in accepting suffering, not ignoring it. Present Holy Father speaks of a paradoxical beauty that is revealed here. A paradox is not a contradiction, but a contrast. On the one hand, Christ is presented as the fairest of men. On the other hand, he has no beauty, no majesty, nothing to attract our eyes. So what is revealed here really is the redemptive beauty of Christ that is, revealed, is shown to us when we contemplate the image of the crucified Saviour. The crucified Saviour who shows us his love to the end. And so, the present Holy Father says, being struck and overcome by the beauty of Christ is a more real, more profound knowledge than mere rational deduction. Of course, we must not underrate the importance of theological reflection, of exact and precise theological thought. It remains absolutely necessary. But to move from here to disdain or to reject the impact produced by the response of the heart in the encounter with beauty as a true form of knowledge would impoverish us and dry up our faith and our theology. We must rediscover this form of knowledge. And he concludes by saying, the encounter with the beautiful can become the wound of the arrow that strikes the heart and in this way opens our eyes so that later from this experience we take the criteria for judgment and can correctly evaluate the arguments. I believe that the present Holy Father here really opens up a very profound dimension of beauty which speaks to the heart of men and women today and in a sense provides a response to this aporia, to this difficulty of grounding beauty again on a metaphysical formation, connecting it again with truth and goodness. Response here comes from the revelation of Christ, comes from the core, the heart of the Catholic faith, but it contributes to something that is very dear to the Pope's heart, that is what he calls the widening of the horizon of reason. In fact, he sees it as a, a false development ever since the Enlightenment, that reason is limited to scientific and technical, uh, technological rationality, anything that well, can be counted, can be measured. And he sees an important contribution of religion in opening this rationality, widening its horizon towards spheres especially like that of the arts, music, where also, um, which also have their own reasons. In fact, 
the reasons which are grounded in the order of creation, in the order of God's creation, the cosmos. And so um, retrieving those reasons can contribute to a widening of the horizon of reason, which also opens it up to faith. So we need to learn, relearn to contemplate this redemptive beauty of Christ, crucified and glorified, which on the one hand shines forth with particular splendor in the saints today, we, um, on the eve of the feast of all the saints. But this beauty is also reflected in works of art, and especially in works of art that the faith has generated. Works of art that have the power to lift our heart to higher things and lead us beyond ourselves to this encounter with God who is beauty itself. It is the Holy Father's conviction, he said this on various occasions, that this encounter with the beauty that Christianity has brought forth is the true apology of the Christian faith. Rational discourse, argumentative discourse is very important and indispensable, but this encounter with the beauty of the faith, especially through the arts, is something that perhaps today speaks much more, with much greater immediacy, is much closer to um, people's hearts. And so for him, said, as said, repeated this various times, it is the true apology of the Christian faith. And in the Catholic tradition, we have a tremendous uh, treasure, a tremendous resource to respond to this search for beauty, which is a bit disoriented ever since um, its grounding in a metaphysical foundation has been lost. So far, what I wanted to say on art and beauty in general, but allow me to say something as well on beauty and the sacred. And I would like to begin with a reference to the Second Vatican Council's Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, because it dedicates a whole chapter to sacred art. And this begins with the following words. Very rightly, the fine arts are considered to rank among the noblest activities of man's genius. And this applies especially to religious art and to its highest achievement, which is sacred art. These arts, by their very nature, are oriented towards the infinite beauty of God, which they attempt in some way to portray by the work of human hands. They achieve their purpose of redounding to God's praise and glory in proportion as they are directed the more exclusively to the single aim of turning men's minds devoutly toward God. This paragraph really contains a concise description of the Church's understanding of sacred art. Sacred art builds on the fine arts. It is a problem, of course, if these fine arts are in crisis, but I shall say something about this in a moment. It builds on the arts in general, but goes a step further. In this paragraph, a subtle but important distinction is introduced, that between religious art and sacred art. And this distinction is not just a nuance, it's actually an important one. We can say that religious art is characterized by the artist's personal approach to a religious theme. Because of this strongly personal subjective element, a work of re religious art may not always be accessible to everyone. Sacred art is born from the artist's engagement with and reflection upon a positive or historical truth of a given religion. We say sacred art, Christian art, is born from the artist's engagement with well, the, a truth of the Christian faith. And in addition to the subjective personal element, which will always be present, obviously, in the artist's creation, sacred art also has this objective quality that transcends the individual's form of expression. For this reason, it can be appreciated by anyone who is familiar with its religious theme. In other words, sacred art aims at a visible translation of a reality that 
goes beyond the limits of human individuality. This has consequences for its forms of expression. As our Holy Father observes, observed in his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, which he wrote as a cardinal, where he dedicates a whole chapter to the question of images. And he says, no sacred art can come from an isolated subjectivity, which means if you approach sacred art, you really have to begin to think, to feel with the church, sentire cum ecclesia. And if you approach a subject of religious art, you think um, of an icon, a representation of a scene from Holy Scripture, life of a saint, a mystery of the faith, you have to enter into the true subject of faith, which is the whole church. So sacred art can never, never come from isolated subjectivity. And the freedom of art, then Cardinal Ratzinger reflects, which is also necessary, obviously, in the more closely confined realm of sacred, sacred art, is not a matter of arbitrariness, which means in sacred art there are always certain, certain criteria, there are also certain rules. If you approach the subject of sacred art, you insert yourself into a tradition, iconographic tradition, architect, architectural tradition, musical tradition, and so on. Without faith, there is no art commensurate with the liturgy. The present Holy Father concludes this reflection. In fact, sacred art is always oriented towards the, the liturgy because it is explicitly and consciously directed to the praise and glory of God, destined for the sacrum, the sacred, which in the Christian, the Catholic context, is not to be understood in some vague or generic sense, but really as referring to sacred worship, the sacred liturgy. So sacred art is at the service of the Church's solemn public worship of God. I believe that the Italian artist and art historian Rodolfo Papa has found a good analogy when he says that between a work of religious art and a work of sacred art, there is the same relationship that unites and distinguishes a poem that speaks of God and a prayer. So religious art in this sense is like a poem that speaks about God. Sacred art is like a prayer. And sacred art is always and inseparably linked with the sacred liturgy. The source and summit, as the Council also says, of everything the Church does. <coughs> The Church has been a great patron of the arts, especially of sacred art, the many, many wonderful churches, chapels, monasteries, and so on, monuments in the whole world speak eloquently. And the Church has been a major factor in the glorious history of artistic creativity in the West. But this crisis of beauty of which I've spoken in the first part of my talk has deeply affected sacred art as well. Pope Paul VI, in his homily to artists given in the Sistine Chapel on the 7th of May, 1964, already lamented the rift between the church and the arts, which in his view had adopted the language of Babylon. He actually said to these artists that were assembled before him in the Sistine Chapel, you have adopted the language of Babylon and you're no longer able to express the sacred. The crisis of sacred art is, I believe, above all, a crisis of the sacred image. Again, I would like to refer here to the reflections of our present Holy Father in this book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, where he speaks about the materialism that comes out of the unprecedented domination of the material world which we have achieved today. We to enjoy today a mastery of the material world that has never been uh, before, but it leads to a certain blindness to the question of questions of life that transcend this material realm. 
and he even speaks of a blindness of the spirit. And so on the one hand, we are flooded with images. We are surrounded by images. We are a, a culture of images. Everything is really focused on the image. But on the other hand, these images remain on the surface. They remain on the empiric level, empiricist level, and do not go beyond that which can actually be well measured, seen, touched. And the transcendent dimension, which is so important for the sacred image, think of an icon, is no longer seen. So we are in a difficulty here because we have lost this faith that sees, that sees beyond sense and appearance. Where can we find criteria for a renewal of sacred art in this situation? Well, one problem in the search for a renewal of sacred art today is that you often hear the objection that if you want to propose certain criteria, iconographic criteria, criteria for um, architecture, art, music, that are drawn from the church's tradition, of course, you meet with the objection that such criteria would place limits on the free exercise of artistic creativity. But as already mentioned, in the field of sacred art, such limits are in fact legitimate and they are necessary. And perhaps they even help criteria, they even help artistic crea creativity to expand, to find um, wider horizons. If you think of great artists of uh, the past that had important commissions from bishops, from uh, popes, uh, Michelangelo uh, in Rome, they entered into a relationship with their patron that was sometimes quite difficult. And they were often told, well, you couldn't do this, uh, you couldn't do that. And um, sometimes there were these um, relationships with their patrons were, were full, full of tensions. But I believe that such tensions also were immensely creative and helped to enter into depths of artistic expression that perhaps otherwise would um, not have been reached. In other words, the church always had, has always nurtured also artists, has um, brought out the greatness um, in artists, which perhaps otherwise wouldn't have happened that way. Today, the church is in this has become very timid in this sense, also perhaps because of uh, bad experiences um, in the more recent past. But it really, really has, seems to have lost its uh, capacity to to nurture, to build up, but also to correct artists occasionally when they enter uh, uh, the sacred, and um, uh, to is a bit timid when it comes to entering into this fruitful. Uh, relationship between patron and artist. But only if we take up, I, I believe only if we take up this um, discourse again, then a true renewal of sacred art uh, can be on its way. The Second Vatican Council in this um, chapter on sacred art, in the same way as Pope Pius XII before in his encyclical Mediata Dei speaks about contemporary art that um, should be given free scope in the church, that should be made to flourish and also to um, express the sacred, but uses an important metaphor. Uh, it speaks of a chorus of praise which contemporary forms of expression should um, join. So this metaphor is important because it presupposes a certain harmony 
into which new voices should be inserted. There should not be always um, uh, cacophony or uh, discordance. And in order to join this harmonious chorus of praise, you also need to insert yourself in the great, rich and varied tradition of sacred art, of sacred music, and so on. In this chapter, the question of images in the spirit of the liturgy, Pope Benedict proposes fundamental principles of an art ordered to divine worship, in other words, of sacred art. I cannot discuss them here in any systematic way, but the first one to me seems essential. He says, the complete absence of images is incompatible with faith in the incarnation of God. Why is that? Why is that? Well, because God has acted in history and entered into our sensible world so that it may become transparent to him. Images of beauty, he continues, in which the mystery of the invisible God becomes visible are an essential part of Christian worship. Iconoclasm is not a Christian option. The word has become incarnate. God is visible in Jesus Christ, his eternal son, made flesh. Christianity is an incarnational religion and the image is really absolutely important for its artistic expression. So sacred art in the Christian context is or at any rate should be figurative art. There are, I believe, also there, there is also place for non-figurative art in, say, a church building, in stained glass, whatever. But essentially, and in the first place, it should be figurative art. It should make visible the mysteries of the faith. It should narrate salvation history. It follows from this principle that the presence of abstract art in so many Catholic churches, at least I'm speaking for Europe, maybe here the situation is a bit different, in so many Catholic churches built recently needs to be questioned. Um, the present situation, well it seems, your reaction seems to suggest to me that the situation is here is not so different from the one in Europe. However that may be, um, I have spent a lot of time on delineating a crisis in sacred art, which we are certainly experiencing today. But on the other hand, there are new developments, very, pr very promising developments, which give us a lot of reason for hope. The gestures of protest, of provocation, which really opened the of modernist movement in art and architecture today are not novel anymore. They um, are really not innovative anymore. Kimball, in this essay I quoted earlier, notes that such gestures today really are only repetitions of Marcel Duchamp and the Dadaists who first had these ideas and uh, presented them, and ever since then it's a repetition of what they did. So there's perhaps a certain tiredness and um, exhaustion on that part. On the other hand, outside the great commercial centers, and I guess in the field of art you always have to remember as well that it is a market, so outside the commercial centers there are very promising developments indeed. For example, a reappraisal of certain artists of the 20th century that um, have been forgotten in the standard works, manuals of art history. And there's also a return to figurative painting and sculpture. And that is by no means, not at all, limited to, well, say, the, the church. On the contrary, it sometimes seems to me that um, the church is really, really lagging behind. And outside um, the sphere of sacred art, there is much um, more going on in that field. A part of our work in this master's degree in sacred art, architecture and liturgy um, in Rome is to give artists and architects a theological and liturgical uh, formation 
And last year, for, for example, we had a very strong group of artists, all Anglophone basically, um, Ireland, Canada, United States, who had all studied in Florence because in Florence you have small private academies where artists learn what to paint figuratively, to sculpt figuratively. And um, they have been really outstanding. In fact, one of them has recently contributed to the, um, well, what I like to call it, resacralization um, of uh, Sioux Falls Cathedral. So there are, in fact, very promising and very hopeful um, development and seems a propitious moment for renewed engagement of the church in the artistic world. The problem is often on the side of the patron who or which commission uh, works of art. And here also a new consciousness is needed both for the problems, the difficulties of the present situation and for um, its hopes and promises. Essentially, when we talk about Catholic artists, I believe that any renewal of art, of sacred art, will be connected with the renewal of the sacred liturgy, because that has been the inspiring force of so many artists in the past and is today. And our Holy Father has taken decisive steps towards such a renewal of the liturgy, and we have reason to hope that the fruits of this renewal will also be felt in sacred art and architecture. He observed in his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy, that the great cultural tradition of the faith is home to a presence of immense power. What in museums is only a monument from the past, an occasion for me of nostalgic admiration, is constantly made present in the liturgy in all its freshness. When you experience a solemn liturgy, I believe, like, like the one we have experienced, celebrated this evening, I think you, this will mean something to you that's where a church with its rich sacred art begins to speak in a new way. In fact, these um, ideas of the then Cardinal Ratzinger very much echo an argument of the French author Marcel Proust, baptized Catholic but rather agnostic. He argued at the time of the great anti-clerical movement in France after the Dreyfus affair. He argued in a time when the French cathedrals were actually under threat, when their, their subsidies were, were, were under threat, and so there was even a talk about secularizing them. Um, he argued that, in fact, their aesthetic impression, their beauty, if you like, was inseparable from the liturgy that was celebrated in them. And he feared that if they were actually no longer used for sacred worship, they would become dead. And his article, published in the Figaro in 1904, also has this title, The Death of the Cathedrals. On the other hand, if these, if the liturgy is alive and renewed and restored in its splendor and in its beauty, I believe that both the art of the great tradition can be seen again in all its freshness and lead to a new inspiration for sacred art and also religious beyond, beyond the more confined circle of religious art today. As a cardinal, uh, Joseph Ratzinger has written of the struggle necessary in every generation for the right understanding and worthy celebration of the sacred liturgy, and the same holds for art and architecture. This cannot be produced, as he says, this cannot be fabricated, as one produces technical equipment, but it is always a gift. And as, he as he says, before all things, it requires the gift of a new vision, a new vision that comes essentially from a faith that sees, and I believe this is what we need to recover, a faith that is able to see. Well, thank you very much.
sure whether I'm in a position to give you really a, um, a, a good answer to that. Um, I'd say um, a, a Catholic artist, uh, perhaps I can say that, a Catholic artist should try to um, draw his or her inspiration from the Catholic faith, and not perhaps not only in the sense of well the contents of the faith, but also the, the vision, a general vision of 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 reality um, um, of the world as created by God, as reflecting God's order and um, God's beauty, and searching for this and searching to convey this to re represent this in in the work of art. I guess uh, um, how to do this. There are as many, perhaps there are as many responses as there are artists, because that is the genius of artistic creativity. That um, every artist has uh, is a, uh, her way of um, expressing this. Uh, thank you for your talk. I guess I was wondering about um, one of the claims from the first part of your lecture, where um, you were speaking of beauty as sort of the primary or having primacy among the transcendentals as sort of the first apology for the faith. <coughs> Um, and kind of following this gentleman's question on Aquinas' definition of beauty, where um, I'm going to assume Thomas is right because I'm in a Dominican parish where he says that, you know, um, beauty is that which when seen pleases. So you see that beauty um, metaphysically is arising out of truth and goodness. Um, can people really be habituated uh, to beauty in a culture that, that's so devoid of truth? Does that have to come first? Even thinking that Christ claims that he is the truth, but he doesn't claim that he's beauty. Is, is truth something that has to be primary and seen first before you can have beauty acting as that apology for the faith? I mean, this, uh, this idea, in fact, that this is the first apology of, of the faith is uh, what, uh, what the Pope says at, at, at various occasions. And um, I believe there is some... Um, well, I see... Uh, we live in a in a world of a general um, intellectual relativism, and um, the force of argument is often just uh, well ignored. Let's put it that way: the force of force of rational rational conversation, rational discourse, because it um, truth is reduced to your truth and my truth, and it's no longer seen that is actually this is some, something object, objective to what to what towards which. We uh, ourselves um, um, sort of, uh, how do you say, um, conform, um, and um, I think in this context, uh, probably uh, the Holy Father means that beauty can have an immediate appeal that helps on this way towards, uh, say, or the, also on the way towards uh, towards recognizing truth. Um, I mean, just from many people who enter a beautiful Catholic churches are touched by, by by what they see in a way that perhaps they cannot completely articulate but they are sort of drawn in by uh, by the beauty that that, that 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 they see there or that they hear you know uh, sacred music as well people who have never uh, had um, much experience of say the great tradition of sacred music when they suddenly exposed to it they sense that there is something there and i think that's perhaps how beauty can be the the first step towards entering into um well uh, beauty truth and goodness which is which is god and one final question 
um, from the, in, in the renovations after Vatican II in America, the average parish church was really aesthetically destroyed. I mean, the point of uh, almost an aggressive ugliness. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm serious, it, it was. And I, I'm wondering, did that go hand in hand? There's a joke that the difference between a liturgist and a terrorist is going to go there. I mean, did it go hand in hand? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the renovations of the man. I mean, I'm, the, my own parish aggressive. It alienated older people, you know, who put their hard money. And to new people, oh, where's the tabernacle? That bird cage in the corner, you know, that kind mm. of uh, it, it, Did they go hand in hand? Or? I think you can blame a lot on liturgists, but not everything. Um, and, and there is there is a wider context. Uh, say, I mentioned this Italian philosopher, Remo Baudet, who speaks of the apotheosis of the ugly. And I don't think he is particularly concerned with liturgy or even perhaps even or church renovation. I mean, this all happens in a wider intellectual uh, context where, well, really, beauty was sort of distrusted and considered suspicious and really as, as concealing the truth instead of instead of revealing it and that's why these all these renovations were done uh, well in the name of honesty and simplicity I'm, and and I'm, I'm sure that uh, most people who actually carried them out uh, well, did this in good faith they thought they were doing the right thing the good thing I mean simply the, the architects in fact um, started before um, the architects started before before the liturgists in ruining uh, <laughs> the churches. The 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 modest modernist movement in architecture that proclaimed uh, ornament as crime and 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 so on. In fact, uh, a lot of that was uh, happening in Europe at least already. This some of that was already happening in the 1930s. Interestingly, um, so this is a wider you know, cultural social context um, which very unfortunately coincided with the liturgical reform. And so a movement was created that was really towards which we look back today with, with utter incomprehension. I mean, when churches were whitewashed, whitewashed, it's amazing, yeah. yeah. But um, I think there is, it is this wider um, intellectual, so, uh, cultural context that contributed to this.